Louis Barassa. He is the director of the Child Amputee Champ Program here in Quebec for the War Amps. I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but it's a, an interesting story. At the age of four, Louis lost part of his right leg in a lawnmower accident. And he was among the first children to be enrolled in the War Amps Child Amputee Program. <coughs> Growing up in Champ, he received peer support and financial assistance for the cost of artificial limbs and attended regional Champ seminars. He was actively involved in the Champ Program. He helped spread the play safe message by giving presentations and writing on the association's float and local parades. So he's a celebrity. And he later became a junior counselor <laughs> answering questions and giving advice to other champs. He's also bonded with several amputee veterans over the years who introduced him to the harsh realities of war and Canada's military heritage. And through Operation Legacy, he participated in commemorative events and continues to pass on the remembrance message to younger generations. He began full-time employment with the War Amps in 1991. So he's been there almost, he's been there uh, 20 years, 30 years, what am I saying? And as director of the CHAMP program, he ensures that child amputees and their families receive the support that they need. He also acts as a spokesperson at events and conferences and takes part in media interviews. Since its launch in 2014, Louis has been involved in the association's advocacy program, which provides a voice for all amputees in Canada and helps them access appropriate amputee care, important financial benefits and or legal rights. And you actually may have seen in the paper the last couple of days where a, uh, I believe it's an amputee here in Quebec has been denied uh, by the Quebec government uh, funding for a new uh, prosthetic leg uh, because they say it's too expensive and uh, he doesn't need a, uh, a one with microchips in it. And I know there's a big uh, question coming along there. Uh, since 2005, Louis also sits on the board of directors of the Office des Personnes Handicapées du Québec, uh, which is uh, again here in Quebec, an association, a it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a government uh, group uh, that uh, supports uh, handicapped people. Louis' commitment to the war amps and to helping meet the records of amputees and their families makes him a very valued representative for them. With that, Louis, I'm going to give you the floor and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I hope that everyone can hear me correctly. So far, so good. Well, I've, I've just realized, um, Mr. Ferris, that you know me better than my sons <laughs> after reading this. Anyway, I, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So for us, uh, the association, it's the only way we can uh, provide information on our various programs and the help that we are providing, not only for kids, but for adults and also veterans. And as a matter of fact, I just want to underline that we are lucky enough because our national board of directors, the president will turn 100 years old this year and is a World War II veteran. And he lost his leg um, above the knee in the deep battle. So uh, uh, we're still really proud. And the connection <laughs> with the, um, the association, uh, with the name that we have, but we have to remember that the association was uh, created just after the First World War. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of a history, but it's going to give up, give you a little bit more info on how we are working, even in this time of pandemic, if you like. When the First World War happened, there were like no association at all, no um, pro government programs to help amputees and also to help veterans from the war. And um, so the the, the amputee, the, the one who have been amputated during the, the First World War, decided to create a group and for, further on it will become the, uh, the War Amputation of Canada. But anyway, they create this group. And a couple of years after that, we had the Second World War. And again, we had no government program, nothing to receive or to welcome back those veterans who have lost their limbs in a combat overseas. But the group from the First World War were there to welcome them and to teach them how to live their life to get, well in a new way uh, uh, as an amputee. So that shaped the association. And later on, we're going to have the Korean War. And after the Korean War, we've decided to um, create a kind of a program that will help 
the entire Canadian population. But again, it was the veteran who decided to create that and to welcome adult and young amputees. So that's the, we, that's the spirit of the association. And it's still today like this. Uh, every time there's a new amputee or okay. every time there's a new family who's giving born uh, uh, to, with a kid with a limb deficiency, we're going to be there. And uh, the, we have, well, we are reaching them mainly now with phones and Zoom or what have you. We have, you know, like the, the web but we're still there to provide them conferred support and exchanging information about the amputee. We may think that uh, the government is there, and that's right, is there, is uh, providing with artificial limbs that, uh, well, the basic one, I would say, that's for the province of Quebec. Because um, you may be surprised to realize that, or not may be surprised because you had like various members across the country, so that even if you're a Canadian citizen, and you may have a different type of um, uh, financial support from the government. If you are born in New Brunswick or in, Columbia, uh, or in Ontario or in Quebec. So in Quebec, the government will pay for the basic artificial limb. And in New Brunswick, families will receive no financial support. And in Ontario and in British Columbia, it's gonna be something like between the private and the public, but anyway, the association is there to provide financial support to make sure that those young ones, well, the younger ones, have the artificial limbs that they need to go through a normal life. And that means a lot because um, when I was four years old, a couple of years ago, and um, I felt that I was the only one in the world, you know, like thinking about, I was, I'm from the Eastern Township, a little town called Bromptonville, close by Sherbrooke. I was the, anyway, the, the only one, I, I think, when I lost my leg in the lawnmower accident, actually, my, my dad was driving the, the machine. And uh, at four years old, even though he told me like many, many times to do not like get close to the machine, uh, I guess that I, I went there to help them, uh, to, help, to help him, sorry. And then the accident happened. I climbed on the machine, slept under the uh, lawnmower tractor and the, the blades and well, the, 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 that's, that's history now. But anyway, just, I remember myself that I was, even though, because for a young one, uh, losing a leg was something terrible in a way, but on the other part, it was not that terrible because I had this support from my family. My mom and my dad were great with me and that was, uh, a great support. However, um, I was kind of feeling because my dad was felt guilty, was crying almost every day after the accident for him, and it's normal. It was really, really difficult. But as a child, I remember that seeing the sadness in my father's face, I felt guilty that he felt guilty. It was my fault, you know, like. I had not that big challenge with my amputee or my leg because at four years old, you just go out, do your stuff. Even if you're going through a hard time, it's life. It's like this. But when you see the react, when you see your dad and sisters and mom that they are uh, crying and seeing that you see like those negative reactions that they could have, they are trying the best. But I mean, we were the only one. When the association with the child amputee program welcomed us, it was a life changer. Um, first of all, we had a chance to meet another family who have been through exactly the same story. And my dad, with the dad who was driving the lawnmower, I mean, from Mathieu, anyway, it, they become close, close friends. And those connections make a big, big difference. We are not, we are not there to, to propose, uh, you know, like medical advice. We're just there to exchange information, exchanging, and you know, pass along our life experience to other families. That's the moral support that we are providing to them. And we're still providing that throughout Zoom and phone conferences that we are doing. With the financial support, that's another thing. You know, like when uh, Jim, you were referring to artificial limb with microprocessor. Uh, well, you see, uh, we, we may think that microprocessor chip uh, needs are kind of the new technology, but 
you know, like that technology exists for the last 20, 20 something years. Um, so we don't think that cellular phone today are real big technology. I mean, it's a thing that we need to, to have. Now for some MPT, I'm not saying that it's good for the, all of the MPT, but for some MPT, um, those microprocessor chips are really, really important. It will make a difference between being sit at, sitting at home and doing nothing. And with the proper need, that person will be able to go back to work or to do a normal life. And I mean, we cannot stop people. I mean, you know, at your age, at my age, we want to be active. We want to be part of the society. So are we, I mean, I'm just questioning myself. I know I don't have the answer. I mean, do we, do we have the, 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 the are we in a situation where we are judging in, I, I mean, in the country, somebody behind, beside their desk, they are judging what type of leg is good for an amputee and they are not even an amputee and they don't even have the formation. I'm just, I don't know the answer, but for me, it struck me that if you're born or you're a 45 years old man from New Brunswick, you won't receive the money, you, well, the money to buy you an artificial limb and you'll go with the association. Well, fortunately enough, we have enough funds at the moment to provide artificial limbs to the population in the country. And uh, well, specific, specifically for the, kid, for the kids, uh, for us, it's really important to make sure that they will live a full active life. And then when they will come at the age of adult, then they will see that they can do whatever they want and then go on a workplace, find a job and be part of the system. If I can say maybe system is not a good word, but you know, like have a family and be proud of themselves. Um, that's sort of the story for the adult. Uh, we are at the level that now that we are uh, kind of, it's, it's not as it used to, what it was, because you know, like artificial limbs price are going really, really higher every year. And um, it's just a new reality, I guess. And that's why, and, and we are really proud of that. I mean, that's why we are in the Canadian population mind. And in 1946, when we uh, created the key tag savers, I'm sure you know like those little tags that you can attach to your keys. Uh, well, mainly if you found a set of keys with those tags, I mean, just call us and we'll go grab the keys and return it directly to the owners of the set of keys. And um, every day at the office, we are receiving uh, lost keys. And I don't have the figures for last year, but I have the figures for the last, the year before, and we have returned 15,000 set of keys to the, uh, to the Canadian population who have lost their keys. And there's no price attached to those keys. I mean, uh, to those key tags, you can, um, you can, it's a donation. People are giving whatever they want. The affiliates right to give. And um, we are, we are doing great since 1946, and we are providing Canadian services uh, to to Canadian services. I mean, in a way, because we are kind of security, we were going to providing a policy, a secure policy for your set of keys if ever you're losing it. But we are also providing help, fun, financial support to Canadian amputee. And um, as a conclusion, I mean, we are really proud because we are starting to challenge, in a way the insurance company and the government telling them, hey, I mean, we are there, that's fine. But I mean, you have to do the extra step. I mean, uh, so the insurance company and the politician have to realize that in this country, people are not treated the same way from one province to another province. And that's, that's shocking a bit. And um, there's a lot of amputee in this in the Montreal Island that we are providing help. Um, and um, it's just like something that we have to continue. I mean, it's not, we come, we come a long way. And I guess that the obstacle and the challenges in this big city is not as it used to be. And that's part of, I have a tendency to believe it's part of the association, but it's also part of those wonderful kids. I mean, the way they're accepting their artificial limbs, the way they are accepting their new way of living with their amputation. I mean, when you see the, the smile in their face, you realize that, I mean, we have done something. And those kids will 
will take care of them, will teach them how to live with an amputation to make sure that they will live a normal, full active life in the future. So, um, and it works for me and it works for thousands of them. Um, when, the, um, you know, I, I'm at that age that, you know, like when I was young, for me, getting married was a big, big thing. And I'm still with the same wife today, but for me, it was a big, big goal in my life. And I've, when I've met, you know, like other amputee who have reached that goal, I said, okay, if they can do it, I'll be able to do it. And that's, that was for me something like important to it, to see that it exists and I was able to do so. Uh, thank you again for your, um, for your, um, your, that's for you now with the Zoom thing, eh? We can say for your silence and maybe you're not <laughs> speaking about yourself. Thank you so much for your time. It's really appreciated. It's the only way the association can tell the public of what we are doing with the donation that we are receiving because we receive no government for, uh, funds. We receive no uh, government for, funds. So thank you so much. Very, very well done. Thank you, Louis. Just so that you know. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. I've had mine for 50 years yeah. or so. And uh, uh, I've been involved with the war amps and my brother is a big, uh, uh, big support of the war amps also. So I, I think you've got lots of people that are backing you. I've got one question here that somebody was asking. Yep. And uh, the they'd like to know, and I, while we were doing this, I actually looked it up online. So it's very impressive. But the question is, uh, uh, of all the fundraising uh, that you do, of all the money that you get, how much goes to actual projects and how much is used for administration? Uh, that's a good question. We are really proud. Well, first of all, I have to, I have to say that we are a big employer of MPT. I mean, we have three offices in, the, in this country, one in Montreal, one in uh, Ottawa, and the other one, suburb Toronto. And um, we, um, we are way far behind you know, like the, uh, the, the, the quota that the government is giving them for the amount of disabled pe uh, person working for a nonprofit association. So we are really proud to say that we are a big employer for a disabled person. And uh, I don't have the exact figure for last year, but the year before and the other years, we've never reached 10% of administration. Oh, the really? rest of the money goes directly to the Canadian MPT. That's, it, it's, it's really important for us. I want, I guess that's for me, it's really important because I won't be able to stand in front of you and telling you, ah, oh, you know what? That's the reality, we need funds and it's not as it used to be. And we, we <coughs> should spend like more than 10%. It's not, it's not, it's not okay for my point of view. That's, that's the figure. Excellent. Uh, now, I think uh, just I'm just a little behind myself here. Uh, Rod DeCourcy, if you'd care to unmute yourself, I know he has a comment he'd like to make. Okay. Uh, Louis, I've, uh, I can probably rival Jim in how long I've been supporting <laughs> War Amps through the key tag and also uh, the little address slips. But yeah. I also, I believe it was through War Amps that I bought quite a number of DVDs uh, on. Uh, in fact, I think the chairman of War Amps was an old veteran uh, who sponsored many of those movies, particularly the Italian campaign. Would you care to comment on that? Yes. Well, I can speak for hours from the, uh, regarding Mr. Chatterton. Cliff Chatterton was the one, well, first of all, he lost his leg again in the Second World War. And when he was back, he was the, um, turned out to be welcomed by the veterans from the First World War. And then this became the, chief executive officer of the association. And before, at, during the eighties, he said, you know, like we have to do, we have to create, this guy was a, a visionary, you know, he was a great leader. And during the eighties, beginning of the nineties, he said, you know, we should as veterans do something to make sure that the younger generation will remember what really happened in the on the fields during the first and the second world war. So we've created uh, the Operation Legacy uh, program 
with the series of films called Never Again. And we've created those documentaries on the First World War, the Second World War, and the Korean War. But it was not those type of movies that you could watch at the movie theater, th thinking that Rambo or all those actors can be on the field and do their job and no one, no casualties. So it was documentaries where we're telling stories, dates, moments specific in the war and battles. So when you were talking about the Italy campaign, that's funny because I, th I guess it, it is one of the most unknown battles that the, 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 the Canadian have been through. And we were talking about Viet, Normandy, we were talking about all those uh, Hong Kong uh, uh, battles that the, the Allies have done. But the, the Italy campaign is something that we have forgot, I guess. So we've decided to create the, um, the, the a, a two hours video on that. And the way, that, the, the way it was, it, well, Mr. Chatterton was funding most, uh, most of them. But when the documentaries were done, they were sell at the cost recovery price. So we were not, you have to say that we were asking like $20 or $10 for the DVD. At the end of the day, it balanced, you know, like for, for the production and creating those DVDs. And uh, just like to conclude, we have sent those DVDs to uh, schools from across the, across the, uh, the, the, the country and from, for all the donors that they wanted, to libraries, and um, we were, it was part of a, uh, a mission, I guess, that the, um, the, the, the children had to spread to the new generation, just to measure that. I mean, I've learned from the guy. I mean, well, I should say I've learned from the guys. And then it's my turn to give something back. I mean, yes, I'm helping Canadian MPT, but I'm also make sure, trying the best that I can to make sure that this memory, I mean, we won't lost it. I mean, because we have a tendency to repeat what we don't remember. So uh, that's, that's our main objective. Okay. I hope I answered the question well. <laughs> no, that's, no, you were doing fine. I was trying to speak and I forgot again to unmute myself. Welcome to the real world. Uh, I know the War Amps is best known for the key tags, uh, but where does the association's revenue come from now? Which programs are the biggest ones now, and, and where do you see the growth? The we uh, I'm it's, it, we only receiving donation through the key tag program, uh, the key tag service. Sorry, it's not a program. So people are giving to the key tags. We are sending those tags across the board. And uh, the, the generosity of the Canadian population is really good. They are giving, sending us the donation. We are sending back a receipt. At the end of the year, we are thanking them with the address labels, but that's, that's about it. We are, we are not making any fundraising over the phone or uh, television or what, I'm sorry, I'm not judging. I'm just saying that the only way we can reach the public it's with the key tag service, the address labels, and throughout those type of presentation that we are doing in schools, we are doing in front of clubs like you. So um, that's the only source of revenue that we have. That's amazing. That really is amazing. Yeah, it is. Right? And I think I can say this without talking out of school, but I, I know personally one person uh, who has, is leaving half of their estate to the war amps. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know of another person who the question that came up earlier actually came from a person outside of the club, not here today, who is looking for a place to leave money in her estate and wanted to know about the, uh, the administration and everything else. So the, your reputation is obviously very, very strong that people are, think, think of you uh, top of mind like that. Thank you very much. And, um... Uh, I guess uh, it is amazing to see some estates that we are receiving and uh, the, the pe people are, it's, are generous and they are asking, make sure that this portion of the estate is spent for children in the Montreal area or to adults or to veterans. 
and um, we are respecting that. And it's it's a it's a nice gesture, I guess. And uh, we are really really happy to uh, to be able to help them. We will receive from time to time donors who wants to receive uh, written information about estates or they can give to the association. So that's right. And uh, we are providing the information. But I just want to underline because that's a, a thin line, okay? A thin line, if I can say. We are not and we will never be those type of association or organization that will start calling people and put pressure on our donors. I mean, the uh, reputation of the association has always been clean and the same. We are respecting our donor and we are not pushing, if I can say. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's something really interesting. Great. Another question here. How many amputees do you help in any given year? Oh, that's a really good question. It's difficult to put a number. A couple of years ago, um, we used to say that, uh, oh, well, in the 90s, 20, uh, end of 90s, we were saying that we, uh, we help more than 15,000 uh, MPT across the board. Now it's more or less 25,000. We have to understand that we have opened our registration to all amputees. So all the partial hand, all, the, uh, all those people that don't really need artificial limbs, but they will receive something, the moral support from other type of, uh, from other amputees. So it's kind of difficult to put, to point out the, num the number, but we can uh, easily say that we have reached help uh, more than 25,000 MPT across the board. So it's amazing. And all our information, I would say it's more than that. Now with the web, uh, you know, like we were really in, I'm sure every one of you remember the thalidomide victim. At that time, they had uh, yes. no compensation from the government. And we've decided to sue the government and we won the case. Oh. They got their first, um, contribution from the government a couple of years ago. Now, it is because we were there to help them to promote their case in the court. And um, now this document, uh, the, the idea of the Talidamide that we as population can sue our government who have accept that uh, pills. Uh, now it is free of charge available to everyone needs it. So people from Afghanistan, people from Europe are calling us or going through our web and trying to collect the information and trying to have the same result in their country. So 25,000, it's a big number for this country, but I'm pretty optimistic that we are helping more than, uh, more than that across the board. But I don't want to go to spread my thought everywhere. I'm just saying that we are mainly focusing on the Canadian population. How many people in a given year lose their limbs in Canada? Oh, that's that's a figures that we don't have. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'm really surprised. Sometimes we, we can pass a couple of weeks without any enrollment. You know, like no new families, no new adult MPPs. And then suddenly a week, we receive 40 of them. So it's difficult. And more than that, there's two uh, points that it is difficult to identify is, first of all, there's no, uh, not a survey, but there's no, you know, like the government across the board is not taking like, like, okay, you're an amputee, I'm going to put you in my numbers, and then I can call you an official amputee by yourself. So if we could have this survey done across the board, it will, would have been so nice for us, it would have helped us to reach those amputees. So we don't have those figures. And on top of that, <laughs> you could be, let's say that you don't know the association and that's okay. You don't know the association and you lost a limb. Uh, let's say like me, right leg below the knee. And then the only way you could be uh, called a disabled person from the, under the IR government, it's with the with the disability tax credit. And let's say that the government refused to give you the disability tax credit. 
even if you have just one leg, you will not be a disabled person. So we won't be in a way. I mean, for him, that person being in the association from his eyes will be like, if I'm not a disabled person in the front of, in, in the eyes of government, how can I be enrolled in the child and beauty program or the adult program of the association? So it's really tricky. So we don't have those figures, but we wish that we could have access to those numbers. And, um, and uh, it's, it's just like too difficult to say, but we can say that we have enrolled, let's say years, we can say that we are enrolling more than 100 a years, but some years it's bigger than that and, uh, and the other year is less than that. Is your key tag service unique to Canada? Are there any other countries that do this kind of thing or other associations? Um, that's, that's a really nice question because for some reason, it only works in Canada. I know that other uh, countries uh, have tried, but not with the idea of adding a service. You know, like you could see on the market, not mainly in Canada, it doesn't work. Uh, people can buy kind of, it's quite expensive. You can buy those electronic chips that will give you, if somebody, and if you lose your set of keys and somebody has a cellular phone with the Bluetooth activation, whatever, you know, like it's done, it's going to ring and then you'll try to figure it out where your keys are. It just doesn't work. And that's the only place in, uh, in the, well, as far as I'm concerned, that's the only place in the country uh, in the in the world that this system is working. And it's working, but a lot of countries would like to see that system work in their countries, that's for sure. Very interesting. It's very strange. Are there any other associations in Canada that you work with uh, to help amputees? Um, you, you, you obviously here in Quebec, you are part of a, a government organization. No, we are not part of the of the government. We are. But, 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 but you, but you are with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Myself, I'm there for. A, it's like <laughs> volunteering because they need somebody on the national board, on the board, and I said, okay, I'll be there. So the, I'm, I'm advising them, but uh, that's something different with L'Office des Personnes Handicapées. And um, so I would say that we are the only one. However, it's kind of a, a give and take, you know, like uh, the facility center, prosthetic centers, you know, like where they are creating those wonderful limbs. I mean, know the association, the association, they know that we are, we can provide financial support to families. So of course, when they receive a denied from the government or the private insurance, they will contact us to see if we can help uh, this entity. And it's, we will say yes, that's for sure. But it's kind of a, we are not associated with them, but on the other hand, they know that we are there. Yeah. Here's a cute question. Does Canada Post charge the war ramps? for sending the tags that are placed in the mailboxes. Does someone is recording now? <laughs> um, years and years ago, when we were returning found keys to the donor, the system was working like we were putting this key tags and uh, key chains in a regular envelope and we were sending the regular envelope to the donor. So yes, the government was charging uh, for the services that we were providing. With the years, we've realized that you like when you, uh, and the technology have changed. So uh, uh, when somebody lost a set of keys, sometimes you have those electronic devices that cost a lot of money, you cannot get access to your car, your home, and things have to, be, to move a little bit faster. So we are returning them by courier. So we are using, depends on the region, but we could use like through a later to send those uh, keys and uh, yes, yes, it's true we are paying for that. However, I must admit that uh, the vast majority of time, when we are, when the donor receives his keys, he has a tendency to do make another donation. Then that's more or less you know, like covering the cost of the um, of the shipping. It's a service that we are providing, but. Mainly Canadian population are really, really happy to receive their keys when they lost them. 
And and the, the, the program is Canada wide, is that correct? Yeah, Canada wide. And, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Franklin, are you there? I certainly can you hear me? I can hear you very well, sir, as always. Would you care to thank our uh, guest speaker today? I certainly look forward to that. Go ahead. You know, it's, inter it's interesting in your presentation about the history of, of the war amps, which began after World War I and the various wars that Canada has been engaged in where men and women sacrificed their lives, but also their limbs in order that we may live in a free country called Canada. It's interesting that in your presentation, I don't believe I ever heard the word disabled. And your proof that people that are, have amputations are not disabled. It might be handicapped, but they can live a, a meaningful and fruitful life such as you have by devoting your life to help others in need. So thank you very much for your presentation. Certainly worthy of our support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the award. Thank you very much, David. Much appreciated. Uh, I'm just, okay, I just wanna make sure I don't get in trouble here. Bear with me, I always, this is the time of the meeting where I always get in trouble. Okay, thanks very much again, Louis. Uh, uh, that was a, a wonderful